This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome back to the Thoughtful Travel Podcast for 2018. I hope you had a lovely holiday season and are having a great 2018 so far. I know I am. I'm recording this just a few days into the new year, but I managed to celebrate the new year in a lovely fashion here in Perth with a trip to the beach and some fireworks by the beach um, with some good friends and with my lovely seven-year-old who made it up to, he managed to stay up till midnight without a without a hitch. I didn't think he could do it, but he did. So <laughs> he really doesn't like sleep very much. So we've had um, yeah, we've had a lot of fun over this break, and I'm grateful though that uh, I'm back with the Thoughtful Travel Podcast because I've missed making it. It's one of the most fun things I do. So 2018 is going to be a big and wonderful year for the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm hoping to hold some more Thoughtful Traveler meetups and. Quite exciting news for me. I've got our first sponsor for this month as well. So more on that in a second. Um, and I do promise, of course, I'm only making sure I, I align with sponsors who are really a good fit for our audience. So um, I'm not going to uh, start spruiking Contiki Tours or something like that, although they have their place, but they're probably not what, um, what most of the um, listeners to the Thoughtful Travel Podcast are ready to do right now. Uh, anyway, today's episode is all about traveling in, uh, well, in off the beaten path places. I started out putting an episode together just with um, stories about, you know, more unique and less visited destinations. And then when I got down to it, I realized that by chance they were all in Africa. And so, in fact, today's episode is now all about travel in Africa. But it's certainly not your standard, um, you know, tourist trip to Egypt or um, or a safari uh, in the southern parts of Africa, it's about three less visited places. So more on that in a minute, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So um, we'll get on to that. But first of all, I need to welcome Glamping Hub on board as the sponsor for the Thoughtful Travel podcast for the next four weeks. Uh, so you probably already know I'm not really one to stay in a boring chain hotel at all. So I do love what Glamping Hub offers, which is a website uh, where you can find unique accommodation and largely in nature or really close to nature. So over the next month, I'll highlight some of the great accommodation you can find on Glamping Hub. But since this episode is about off the beaten path travel, I thought I'd mention some of the more remote accommodation you can find there, like the luxury camping huts in the Sadani National Park in Tanzania, or uh, there are some gorgeous lakefront stilted huts in Zimbabwe, a set of log cabins in Tibet, or closer to me, but pretty far from the rest of the world, I found a beach glamping resort an hour away from Broome in Western Australia. Um, and I had a laugh when I read the reviews on this one because someone said it was perfect, except for the noisy sound of the crows. And I will always remember when I moved back from Germany to Western Australia. And at least for the first week or so, I was woken up uh, too early and not pleasantly by the birds outside my window because they just have really bad voices compared to the pretty European birds. There was one that I always called the asthmatic bird because it sounded like he was about to die of an asthma attack. Uh, anyway, there are thousands of other cool places to stay listed on Glamping Hub. So just head over to glampinghub.com and have a browse. And I'm really grateful for their sponsorship, which helps keep the podcast going. Now onto our first guest today, and it's Ian from the Barefoot Backpacker. He's been to some really unique places in the world, and he's certainly travelled uh, had a really interesting trip in Western Africa, some of which you've heard about before. And today he tells me a little about Benin. Now, if you need a little geography lesson, because I sure did, I had to check on a map. At least I'd heard of the country, but I really didn't know where it was. So it's kind of in Western Africa, between Togo and Nigeria. One of my favourite countries in the world is Benin. And I went there three years ago and nobody goes to Benin even now. So I, uh, if I'm ahead of a trend, I'm really ahead of the trend. Yeah, you must be ultra ahead of the trend because I think you're the first person I've spoken to who's been to Benin. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give me give me the three sentence description of why Benin so amazing. Oh, um, OK. It's full of culture. It's full of history. It's full of vibrance. 
Uh, when I was there, I saw a jazz. Uh, they had a jazz festival, well, jazz music festival on not just jazz, but all kinds of um, world music, African music, foreign music, um, instrumentals, singers um, in Kotunu when I was there. I think that's a yearly thing. Um, they've got voodoo markets and oh, voodoo cool. ceremonies. Wow. Excellent. Um, and some of the things in the. <laughs> Yes, they have, they're one of those religions where something physical represents something emotional. Uh, so if, for instance, you want to get rich, then they will have some kind of fetish or object that has in some way or shape or form a connection to money. Right. Now... Most people go to voodoo ceremonies for one of two reasons. One is to bring them luck in exams or job interviews or what have you. The other one is to bring them, how should we say, virility. Right, got it. <laughs> and it would not be particularly um, difficult to imagine the sorts of objects that they use <laughs> in voodoo ceremonies to promote virility no i can probably imagine some quite easily you're right <laughs> it's bigger than you're imagining right <laughs> okay oh i'm gonna have to hop on google later yeah go on <laughs> <laughs> this does sound like a very fascinating place <laughs> uh, it's also got history as well though i mean benin is one of those um obviously you've got the dark history of the slave trade but you've also got a, the Dahomey Kingdom, which is one of the big kingdoms of West Africa at the time and beyond. Right. So you've got all of the you've got all of the history of the kings and the palaces that the kings had, um, which is it's quite vibrant. It's quite interesting. Um, and then up in the north of Benin, you've got a small, um, effectively safari, a place you can go to for safaris, huh. and you've got um, those traditional well, not quite Saharan, Sahelian, um, desert villages. Oh, unreal. Wow. Well, it, it's a very much a country of contrasts. Yes, I had no idea. Hot. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. No mountains. But it's, it's, um, it's, it's definitely a country of contrasts. Yeah. And it's very friendly, and it's got really nice beaches that are empty as well, if you're into that sort of thing. I do like a good empty beach. I'm from Western Australia. We <laughs> only have empty beaches. I really do love hearing about places that I've never really thought about going because I kind of barely know they exist. Uh, and Benin, which Ian says is one of his very favourite countries in the world, does sound really fascinating. Uh, so I look forward to discovering more about it and eventually getting there someday. So um, thanks to Ian for that. Now, our second guest today is new to the Thoughtful Travel podcast. Her name is Linda Schlenker. And I met Linda last year, early last year, uh, when she came to Perth for, um, I think it was like the caravan and camping um, show, one of those kind of things, and she was uh, had a stand for her business, which takes people to um, on these cool tours around the world. But we got chatting about all kinds of topics, and one of the places that she's been recently, which she found really, really fascinating, was Madagascar. And I thought it was so timely because it's the holidays here, school holidays, and my son has been binging on the Madagascar movies. So it was really interesting to hear about what the actual non-animated Madagascar is all about. Because it was so different to what I was expecting culturally, I did find myself thinking a lot more about how everything worked there. Um, you know, it's a it's it's definitely a, a country that's it's dirt poor, like the people are very poor there, but so incredibly happy and nice, like nicest people. Um, and they've only humans have only been there for about two thousand years, and you know I mm. mistakenly thought that they'd come would have come from Africa because it's right there. But you know it was sixteen million years ago. I think that that whole Gondwana land split, and and Madagascar was part of that, and it split off, and Australia kept moving. Hmm. But there weren't actually any people there. They've got totally different animals to Africa. You know, there's none of the big game there. They don't have elephant or anything like that at all, more lemurs and chameleons and all that sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, the people that are there are actually of Indonesian descent. 
that came around there and a small pocket of more um, African type from across the Mozambique Channel just on the southwest. But uh, I didn't expect that to be the case. And, no, I had uh, no idea. Uh, to me, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, I know of the animals because of the um, movie, but mm. um, the, the animated version of the animals. But uh, to me, I thought it was otherwise just Africa, you know, really like the rest of Africa, but it's obviously not. No, it's not. It's completely different. Um, and and within one country, I mean, it's a huge island. It's the fourth largest island in the world, but it's massive. I mean, if you were to just drive around it, it would probably take you three months to drive around it. We went for a month, so we saw a lot in that month, but wow, did the it change. I mean, one day you'd be on the West Coast and it's hot and it's dry and the, the beautiful white beaches with uh, these sapphire waters, mm. but you jump in and it's like jumping into a bath. It's so hot. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, then, and then a couple of days later, you'll be in an area that has got massive granite cliffs, a bit, you know, looks a bit like El Capitan uh, that the climbers climb in. I think that's in Yosemite. You know, there's am amazing mm. just sheer cliff faces, and that's totally different to what you've seen. And then you're in mm. the next week, you'll be in a rainforest, and it's you know, 15, 20 degrees cooler than it was on the coast and, and, and raining. Wow. Um, and, the and it, you know, the houses and the architecture and things all change as you go around. So it's a very, it's a really rewarding place to travel because it's just so diverse. What you would see within a month of traveling in that country is it's just changing all the time. Um, and the people are, you know, it's predominantly Christian based now. There's some Muslim communities and so on, mm -hmm. but they still have kept all of those old animist beliefs that they've merged in with their version of Christianity. Uh, and they do these, you know, fabulous things like the turning of the, the bones where they exhume their ancestors and take the, the skeleton and rewrap it in uh, silk that they make there and, and then rebury them again. And the richer you are, the more often you would do that. And you'd have this massive party when it's on and kill <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> seven zebu which are their local cattle um and cook that up and you invite everybody uh and so you know i'd never really come across something like that that where it's, it's like a party of death it's like a, a wake i guess um and it's a few uh, years later after uh, it is it's usually say three to five years okay. and um and usually what they what our local guides were telling us that you know you're almost seen as a to be a bad child if you don't do that at least once for your parents right you must save up money and you must do it and it's expensive because as i said they're dirt poor and uh, and a zebu would sell for about 800 us dollars oh wow so for them to this turning the bones that we were lucky enough to see uh and and go and experience with them you know they had killed seven zebu and that's a lot of money for mm -hmm. a family. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible, um, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, I don't think uh, um, my mum's still with me, but I don't think she'll want to be um, pulled up again and <laughs> um, and have her bones uh, turned. No. But, but that's uh, that's their belief is they're um, mm. they're communing again with the ancestors. That's why it's a happy thing, not a sad thing, because it's a party. Because hey, we're we're all getting together again, and it's a, seemed to be as a very joyous celebration. Not I love a, the sound of it. It yeah. sounds amazing. You were very lucky yeah. to stumble across this. Um... We certainly were. And uh, one thing that I didn't see but we heard about, which was another culturally different thing that I'd never heard of, was that uh, you know, the young men are still circumcised there. And the ceremony, the traditional ceremony, is that the grandfather or an elder within the village will actually eat the foreskin that's been cut off with oh. a piece of banana. Oh, with banana. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. nice. <laughs> So we kept on saying that'd be a great title for a blog or something, you know. My grandfather ate my foreskin. It's like, what? With a banana. <laughs> wow, that's um unusual. Yes. And it's something to do about, you know, the, the strength and passing the strength or the masculinity or something, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. through that. But uh Yes, we didn't see that, but they told us that that was kind of like a traditional thing and we thought, okay, that's that's interesting. It's very but interesting. <laughs> So it sounds like Madagascar is another of those kind of surprise destinations that has all kinds of, well, unexpected treasures. And it's not just, you know, one kind of place, but uh, you can experience, you know, a whole variety of things during your time there, uh, which really draws me to a place, I have to say. Um, 
the turning of the bones ceremony sounded so fascinating that I went away and did a bit more reading about it. And I'll leave a link in the show notes to an article I found, which I thought describes it really well um, with a few pictures. Um, but yeah, it certainly is, um, yeah, a really fascinating part of culture, uh, of the culture in Madagascar for sure. But, uh, yeah, I don't think we'll start it here <laughs> anyway. Um, and Linda also sent over some pictures of animals they came across in Madagascar. Uh, she said I should share them with my son who had been watching the Madagascar animated movies and, uh, I'll find a really cool one to share with you too. Um, yeah, Madagascar is a really unique place and, uh, as Linda was saying, it's almost not African, but it is part of Africa. So it's in my episode today about travel in Africa. Uh, now, my final guest today is Anna Kvichinska, and she's uh, a, and Anna came to one of my blogging courses here in Perth well, a few months ago. Um, but she's a fascinating person who has kind of, she now has homes all around the world. In fact, just before I... Um, uh, recorded this episode. I tried to check where she is now, but I'm not sure. So <laughs> she flits around between Perth uh, and Indonesia and India and Morocco. And it is Morocco that she's talking about in this episode today. And I asked her in our chat, what drew her to Morocco in the first place? So the first place is actually 1986. And uh -huh. uh, I think then it was, um, uh, you know, uh, being living in Europe and thinking that Morocco was, um, I, I think I'd been reading, I'd been reading maybe Emil Wire, not Emil Wire. Trying to think, it was the Sahara. It was, um, I guess, a, a, a fascination since my childhood from my mum with Lawrence of Arabia, um. Um, and yeah, it, it was doable. And I guess I'd come as far as. Um, it's Spain and just thought, well, yes, <laughs> Africa's just, just across the water. The, yes. So it was it was almost uh, an impossible uh, task to not go there. Mm -hmm. um, but more recently, going back was, I suppose uh, I'd been finished. I'd finished um, taking a group to Ethiopia, and once again, I'm thinking, well, I'm on the African continent, and <laughs> I'm not ready to leave yet. Hmm. Uh -huh. uh, I think Morocco sounds good and we'll see how that's changed. And so noticing the changes was very interesting. When was this that you returned? Just a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. So it was, yeah. um, it was some very, very... decades later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I had, you know, to be honest, I hadn't given Morocco really any thought in between. Um, it wasn't that I was yearning for it in the way that I've, you know, I have this lifelong daily yearning for India through for much of my adult life and have often thought that I should just simply find some way to go and, and live there and indeed mm. business and so on has has taken me there over well nearly three decades so Morocco wasn't um, foremost in my mind but it's interesting to look back now and realize that the pictures that I have of um, experiences in Morocco are quite different from what I experienced two years ago and they were almost Almost, um, almost not, not comparable. They were completely different. Oh, interesting. And, and so Fez, where I'm going to live now, I'm not even sure that I went to Fez in 1986. Uh -huh. I, it's quite possible I didn't, or if I did, it failed to make a strong impression. And maybe I was a little too nervous to, you know, go into that huge Medina and be willing right. to get lost yes yes um, but since then of course there's been the unesco world heritage um placement of it as a as a world heritage site and this 16 year um restoration project which is just coming to oh, right. completion now wow so it has um it's it hasn't restored the city but it's stabilized it okay so it's just now poised i think to become one of the most beautiful places uh, to live, R one of the most beautiful places, so full of surprises. The streets are cobblestoned and largely monochrome, and you gain access through a, an ordinary door, and another beautiful, beautiful, beautiful world opens a port. You know, mm. you know? Sounds um, amazing. It, and it's cool, you know, you walk into those courtyards, and it, it's cool, and the fountains tinkle, and it sounds... Um, idyllic and it, it largely is even if things are very decrepit um, my mind constantly goes to how could I restore this <laughs> how could I live here <laughs> and 
anything Forget is the constant gardener. I'm the constant restorer. <laughs> Anna makes Morocco sound very enticing to me. Uh, further on in our chat, I chatted more about my experiences in Tunisia, which is as close as I've got to Morocco so far. And I'm very confident that based on how much I love Tunisia, I will also love Morocco. Some of the similarities there make me absolutely certain that I will love it. So one day I will get to Morocco too. Um, so we've kind of covered three corners of Africa today, sort of corners, three really different parts of it, uh, and three parts that are not um, particularly well visited or oft visited. So I hope that's uh, given you a bit of a taste for some uh, some African explorations. I know it's a continent that I'm desperate to get back to see much, much more of. Um, so thank you very much for listening to episode 80 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. You can find the show notes at notaballerina.com slash 80. And in the show notes, you'll see links to all of our guests and some of the pictures, etc. So do head over there. Uh, and while you're at it, also look up our Facebook group, Thoughtful Travelers. If you haven't joined yet, you can uh, follow, you know, follow along with lots of great conversations in there about traveling thoughtfully. Uh, so a few links that will be useful to you. First of all, um, another thank you to our great sponsor, Glamping Hub. Easy to find them at glampinghub.com. Uh, we also heard from Ian, who is at the Barefoot Backpacker, and his blog is at barefoot-backpacker.com, or on Instagram, he's at barefoot underscore backpacker. So you've got to get your your underscore and your dash right there. Bit tricky, Ian, but I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a good reason. Um, now, Linda Schlenker is from Self Drive Adventures, and you can find her at, very logically, selfdriveadventures.com. Uh, I've also got a link there to my uh, the article I found about the turning of the bones in Madagascar because it's super interesting. Um, and uh, you can find Anna, Anna Kvichanska, at her main website, which is annakvichanska.com. Uh, I recommend just clicking on the show notes if you're not sure of the spelling. And coming up later this year, in fact, I'm running a blogging retreat um, with Anna in her um, Bali villas, uh, where she runs retreats for various different reasons, art and so on. Um, so I'll leave a link to some of the info on that too. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed your break and I hope you're, I hope you're happy to have the podcast back on the air because I know I am. Um, hit me up on Facebook and let me know or tweet me at Amanda Kendall. You can use the hashtag thoughtful travel pod on Twitter and I look forward to chatting to you again soon. This has been another episode of the thoughtful travel podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now.